is Agha Jari's fifth dimension of Sura. Anyone hear this dog? Okay. All right. So this dog was born in 2012, and, and all three of these dogs that I selected were actually born in 2012 or 2013 because I want to use dogs that are as recent as possible so that I can show you, if I show you dogs from the 50s, it's, it's not as dramatic. I want to show you, you know, what's going on with the dogs you're breeding right now. So this is his pet, this is a sixth generation pedigree, and I know you're used to seeing pedigrees, but Sire is on top, Dam is on the bottom, the Sire is Sire, the Sire is Dam, and so forth um, backward. And, and common ancestor. So not just an ancestor that appears more than once in a pedigree, because if it, it appears twice, but both those times are on the Sire side, then that dog is not line bred on, on, on that, common, that common ancestor. The Sire was, was bred line bred on that common ancestor, but not the pedigree of the dog you're looking at. So the ones that are filled in have to be on the sire side as well as on the dam side. A five generation inbreeding coefficient on this dog is 0.7%, so it's much lower than the average in your um, uh, in AKC dogs. The 10 generation coefficient is 5.6, so a little bit lower than average. And the all generation coefficient was 16.1. So, so just a little bit less than the average pedigree um, in your, um, uh, in, in your uh, matings. So here's the pedigree analysis for him. And the number, and as we know, it's going to be exactly, almost exactly the same every single time. Sirdar of Ganzi contributes almost a third of the genes uh, to this dog. He doesn't appear until the 14th generation, but appears almost a million times in the pedigree. Okay? So, and think about one appearance in the 14th generation. So in the first generation, you, you contribute 50%. The second, you contribute 25 and 12 and a half and six and a quarter and uh, 3.125 uh, and, and 1.57. Uh, so that's six generations. So divide that in half another, um, another eight times. And that's what one appearance in the, in the 14th generation will uh, contribute. But he appears almost a million times. So it all adds up to 31%. And that's how his influence is, is permeated throughout your gene pool. Um, Badsar of Ansdart, who doesn't appear until the 13th generation, contributes more than any great-grandparent, appears over 204,000 times. Uh, Sirkan of Grandeur was from the 50s, so he appears in the 8th generation, contributes 17.5, appears 1,511 times. And the first common ancestor, um, uh, Line, actual line breeding in the pedigree that you're looking at is uh, Sanala's Pretty Woman, uh, who appears for the first time in the third generation, appears three times in the pedigree, contributes 14.8. Um, when you're line breeding, so it, it, if someone has, like Mecca's Falstaff here, contributes 12.7%, appears, doesn't appear to the seventh generation, appears 60 times in the pedigree. So that number is very similar to a, a great-grandparent, 12.5%, all right? But Mecca's fall stuff is more influential than a great-grandparent because his genes are being passed down both sides of the pedigree, and they can be combined back together again to reproduce himself in that way. Whereas a great-grandparent on one side of the pedigree, um, his or her genes are going to be combined with several other individuals both on that side of the pedigree as well as on the opposite side of the pedigree and dilute their influence. So, so a line-bred individual is more influential than, uh, with a dog that has the same number that only appears once in the pedigree. Okay. Um, the next pedigree we're looking at is called Comar's Fire and Ashes. Anyone ever hear of this dog? Okay. So um, this dog is, you know, you see a lot of color here. So this dog is, is very, very line bred. And in actuality, we see Comar's uh, Terra, and, uh, Terra and Round as the paternal grand dam and also as the maternal grand dam. All right. So with that relationship, how are the sire and the dam related to each other? So it's, this is a half-brother, half-sister mating, okay? Just based on that half-brother, half-sister mating, that contributes 12.5% of the inbreeding coefficient, just on that single relationship. And a uh, first cousin mating is, is six and a quarter, and an 
aunt, nephew, or uncle, niece is 12 and a half, and, and these numbers are in the long article that you can find on the web. Um, but just the single representation adds that number to that inbreeding coefficient, and then and then the basic background inbreeding with 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 uh, um, Sir Khan of Ghazi and, and everyone else is what produces the rest of that inbreeding coefficient. So we've got a lot of relationships here. And in five generations, um, Comar's fire, fire and Ashes has an inbreeding coefficient of 15.5, 10 generations, 18.4, and um, all generations, 29.2. So most of the commonality that caused the higher um, embryonic coefficient comes from more recent line breeding here, which is tighter than the average. And then the all generation embryonic coefficient is more than, than the average for, um, uh, for your breed for 2012, which is when this bitch was born, um, but not significantly so um, in that regard. So here is the inbreeding coefficient. Comar's Terran round contributes 50% uh, as much as a parent because it appears twice as a grandparent uh, in the second generation. And Sirdar of, Ghaz uh, of Ghazni, again, a third, appears 4.8 million times in the pedigree, first appearing in the 14th generation. Then you've got your recent line breeding. You've got your background inbreeding. You've got your, um, this one is, is and Sircon again, is kind of in the background there from the 50s. And then you've got your recent line breeding again on these guys um, and this is a more typical line bred pedigree even though this dog is is more tightly bred than the average so you get down with these numbers here and your backgrounds uh kumari of Kaf, you know she appears over a million times shireen of ghazni over a million times as well the last pedigree i wanted you to look at is a uh, culminex made of sapphires anyone hear of her okay and she was born in 2013 and we're looking at a five generation embryonic coefficient of zero. We're looking at a 10 generation embryonic coefficient of 0 0.1. And we're looking at an all generation embryonic coefficient of, of 9.2. So she is a very outbred uh, bitch, okay, in terms of the relationship between the sire and the dam. And so it's not surprising that when we look at her pedigree analysis with all of her relationships that everyone's in the background and nobody is in the foreground. The first individual um, is Sir Khan of Grandeur doesn't appear until the ninth generation. That's, that's the first generation that someone actually starts to appear on both sides of the pedigree. So this is what all of your dogs the, the background of all of your dogs comes from. And in terms of the background, everyone pretty much is the same. Everyone's going to be a third to, to Sirdar of Ghazni. You're not going to be able to get away from him. Okay? Um, he's there. And then he is your breed. And then you've got these others here as well that are, are very significant in your breed and understanding the background of your breed, understanding if you have pictures of them or, or descriptions of them or what they, what they threw or did not throw and, and so forth is very um, important in understanding the influence in your breed. So the last thing I want you to know about these uh, inbreeding coefficients that I mentioned it before is you need to compare the same generation if you're comparing one pedigree to another pedigree in terms of their inbreeding coefficients. So, um, so we see here that, uh, that Aga Jari's um, fifth dimension of Sura, you know, the first uh, line breeding uh, started in, in the fifth generation um, with Comer's uh, Fire and Ashes. It was the second generation. So you've got that 12.5 from the half-brother, half-sister. And from Komenik's made of sapphires, not until the 10th generation. Um, well, it was f first appearing in the ninth, and then on the opposite side of the 10th generation, that provides you the inbreeding coefficient there. So you can see how these numbers go up depending on how deep the pedigree is that you're analyzing, um, that you're using your computerized uh, um, uh, inbreeding coefficient tool with. So that's really important in that regard. The molecular geneticists that are doing genetic diversity uh, studies and are giving you numbers for homozygosity, are, um, they are accurate. Okay, I, I want to tell you that. So the numbers they're delivering you are accurate. Their interpretation of their numbers is what's completely wrong. So it's now I'm not telling you that they're doing a bad job as molecular geneticists. They're doing a bad job as population geneticists because they don't know what they're talking about. All right. And, and we'll talk about why that is so um, uh, during this talk. So in order to understand about breeds, you must understand about breed evolution and how all breeds 
individually evolved. Development of breeds occurred through artificial selection for body type, color, coat type, behavior, and conformational aspects. As breed lines became more specialized and stud books closed, those who did not conform to the standard were removed from breeding. Studies of dog breeds estimate that they lose on average 35% of their genetic diversity through breed formation. Um, and, in actu and that's a molecular geneticist analysis, um, but in actuality, they lose a lot more than 35% uh, through breed formation um, because all the bad stuff gets thrown out. Okay, so this loss of genetic diversity is not bad because it's selection for superiority. It's selection that's going on here. And the bad stuff that you're throwing out, you're losing diversity, but you want to lose that stuff. Okay, so this is how you develop a breed and what breeds are about. This is a pedigree of an average um, Afghan hound. And so this is what you're used to, here's what you're used to looking at in a pedigree. Here's the dog. Here's its siren dam, there are its grandparents and who are now in different generations, so you gotta you know, figure out where they are. But what I need you to look at is back here. These are the founders of your breed. Okay, and this is, this is based off the AHI um, database. Um, and so here are the founders of your breed. And during this phase here, this is what I call the breed and purge phase of, a, of breed formation. This is when they breed and they go, oh wow, that's really nice. And then they breed and they go, Oh yeah, that's not good at all. Okay, we're not, we're spay neuter. Get rid of those. Okay, and then and and so this is how they develop a breed. This is what the original breeders were doing. If they were, you know, if they were of good conformation, or if they could, you know, hunt properly. Um, if they are not sickly, if they're not passing on bad disease. You know, this is this is judicious culling by the original breeders of your breed that formed your breed, and that's all that happened during this period right here. Then you get into a, then once that breed is established, you get into this population expansion here, that expansion phase where that population grows and grows and grows, and now you have a lot of dogs to choose from in terms of who you're going to breed your dog to in that regard. And the truncation here that occurs is only because we're looking at one dog's pedigree. This isn't looking at the entire database because that database would continue to go up this way and continue to go down this way and even with the truncation of numbers it still would be pretty wide based on the background of each of those individuals so again even though a breed may lose numbers it doesn't mean they're losing diversity if they're maintaining unique lines and unique backgrounds so that's the important aspect of genetic diversity Modern breed population statistics, so summarizing this part of the talk, have high deep um, pedigree average intermediate coefficients or homozygosity. Okay, all breeds have high homozygosity. And this is what the molecular geneticists are saying. Well, we were taught because molecular geneticists, population genetics of, of species was developed to study endangered natural species and that's where all the population genetics programs come from and that's where all the population genetics indices and decision points come from it's from studying natural species and and in natural species the, there is no selection that goes on so the only thing that they can look at actually is homozygosity, that they don't want recessive genes to get paired up. So, so the bottom line is homozygosity is bad, and that's the only message that's been passed on to the molecular geneticists is that homozygosity is bad. What is the basis of your breed? Homozygosity. It's the race of every breed, okay? Our dogs are clones of each other. You walk into a dog show, you know an Afghan hound when you look at it because they all look alike. They don't, now, as breeders, they don't all look alike. We see a lot of difference in our dogs, but for a lay person, they, they look exactly alike. And that's, that's what we've created with our breeds. You can look at all the different rings and say, yeah, those are shepherds over there, and those are cavaliers over there. I, I mean, you can pick them out, and you can tell the difference between them because of homozygosity, because of what we have done with our breeding. And it's not a bad thing what we have done low effective population size or a limited number of founders that started the breed, high average relationship coefficients to influential ancestors, and those ancestors appear in pedigrees of every member of the breed with genetic contributions of 15 to 35% on average, Sardar of, of, of Ghazni. These are necessary and expected consequences of breed formation and evolution. 
Homozygosity is not inherently correlated to impaired genetic health, nor does it need to be artificially controlled. Okay, just because you have a hammer, you know, that someone can say, oh, I can calculate a molecular genetic uh, inbreeding coefficient, doesn't mean that every breed is a nail and you need to, to bang on it and, and get those numbers down. Okay, it's got nothing to do with the genetic health of the breed. Healthy breed gene pools require expanding or large stable populations. This allows the creation of new family lines. It allows for within breed diversity. And that's the important thing, within breed diversity. You need diversity to be able to select because these dogs are different from those dogs. These dogs might have something that my dog over here doesn't have and I want to breed to it. If we want to make everybody the same, which is what heterozygosity does, then we, it, 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 it eliminates our ability to select to have different individuals. And population contraction, if it causes the, uh, the loss of quality breed lines, then that will cause the loss of breed diversity. Selection of breeding animals should represent the quality traits and breadth of pedigree background in your breed. Quality lines should not be abandoned. If people have stopped breeding and there's frozen semen available in some of their dogs and, and those lines are not being continued, you want to you wanna concentrate on that frozen semen and, and, and maintain those lines if they're quality lines. There are breeds where they have established a not-for-profit um, organization that purchases the semen from breeders that don't want to use it anymore and that the breed club can utilize that to maintain the genetic diversity of their breed. Um, and so there's, there's lots of options that are out there. So let's talk about the popular SARS syndrome because that is the number one cause of impaired genetic diversity in breeds. And so this is a geneticist pedigree. Um, squares are, are males and circles are females. Horizontal lines are matings and vertical lines are offspring. So let's say that this represents a, a, you know, a nice diverse population in a breed. And then a male comes along and everybody oohs and ahs and says, oh my God, what a wonderful dog. And I'm going to breed to that dog. And so different bitches from different parts of the gene pool are bred to him and they like what they're seeing. So more people from different parts of the gene pool are breeding to him and they like what they're seeing. And so then they start line breeding on him. And very, very quickly, um, within a generation, his genes are spread far and wide throughout the gene pool. That's what the popular sire uh, syndrome is. It's the most influential factor in restricting gene pool diversity. The overuse of a popular sire quickly disseminates his genes throughout the gene pool without the benefit of evaluation over time. And that's the, that's the important point right there. Without the benefit of evaluation over time. We don't know what's going to happen in, this, in the third and the fourth generation um, when things start lining up there. Um, and and that's, that's what, what happens with popular sires. Um, the other insidious thing is that there are only so many quality bitches that are going to be bred with each generation. And if an inordinate number of bitches are being brought to a popular sire, it is sidelining other quality males that should be contributing to your gene pools. And so they're getting sidelined because there are only so many bitches that are being bred with each generation. The, um, the popular sire's influence, so some people say, well, you know, what's the difference between popular sire and Sirdar of Ghazni? Okay, I mean, he's up at 30%. You know, what, what's the difference? The difference is the influential ancestor's contribution is continually evaluated through its descendants with each mating who have to compete with others for breeding status. So those influential ancestors, every generation, they had to win out and be selected for breeding to make the next generation. And if they weren't selected, if they weren't of quality, those are the dogs that, whose numbers continued to decrease and fell off the charts because they're not passing on the quality or they're passing on disease. Okay? If a, and then the other insidious thing is if, you, if a popular sire is found to pass on deleterious genes, and all of a sudden we're saying like, oh my God, 
And you see this in every breed. And it's saying like, man, he's all over the place, but you know, I don't want him in the pedigree. I don't want any of him. So the purging process that occurs if a popular sire is passing on poor quality or disease is that it, you lose the influence of the quality dam lines to which he was bred. So you lose an entire generation of quality dam lines be, uh, by purging a popular sire. Because it's not just him you're purging, you're purging all the bitches that uh, he was bred to as well in terms of the descendants. So, so this is the biggest aspect of, of limiting our genetic diversity is the popular sire syndrome. So let's uh, um, talk a little bit about diseases and disorders, which is what I call, pay attention now, the dark side of breed development. <laughs> so all individuals carry some deleterious mutations. Everyone's got got a mutation or two. Um, quality individuals who propagate will also propagate their deleterious mutations. And these can cause breed-related disease if they're disseminated and increase in frequency through the founder's effect. So, you know, this is something we do have to watch. What, what are my dogs producing and what are their offspring producing in that regard? If, there's some, if there is some line breeding going on, what are we seeing versus when they, when they are outbred on? Breed propagation must always include active monitoring which means breed health surveys, and selection, again, the most important aspect of dog breeding, against genetic disease. Without this selection against genetic disease, the genetic health of the breed will decline. And that's the bottom line. So we can, we can never ignore health. And I'll talk about this again when we talk about health in the second half. The genetic health of dog breeds is not a direct function of homozygosity or heterozygosity but of the accumulation of specific disease liability genes. Okay? It's specific genes that cause specific diseases. So fancy numbers are not going to rescue a breed or make a breed healthier. You need to select specifically against what you don't want and select for specifically what you do want in that regard. So in breed maintenance, uh, so let's talk about what the uh, molecular genetic companies want to tell you about genetic diversity. So in response to perceived concerns with genetic diversity, some advocate for SSP type outbreeding programs, SSP species survival programs. Okay, so they're taking this completely from the endangered species and recommendations to only outbreed or those, breed to those least related homogenizes breeds and erases the genetic differences between individuals. So you've got your Wisdom Health Optimal Selection from Mars, you've got your Embark, and you've, and you've got the UC Davis um, Veterinary Genetics Laboratory Genetic Diversity Panel, Niels, P Niels Peterson's uh, pet project there. And so all three of these, all that they're saying is that whatever dog that exists in Afghans that is the least related to your dog is the best possible mate. Okay, that's how all of you need to be breeding from here on in. All right, is that, so that's, so we're all on board now. That's how you select who you breed to. The one that's the least, has the lowest number related to your dog. Is that okay? Why not? Has nothing to do with selection, which is the only thing breeding is about is selection. All right, so we need to understand what, what we're being told about homozygosity and about these genetic diversity panels. So if we have here, you know, if, if people in a breed, and I use this slide to teach about cats and dogs, so I apologize for the cat heads, but, uh, you know, here you have some people are line breeding in this part of the gene pool, some people are out breeding, you know, uh, you know one to, to over there in the gene pool, and, and everyone's doing something a little different versus the out breeding only. If it's this dog here, it's got to be bred to this one because it's the most unrelated. If it's this dog here, it's got to be related, bred to this one to be the most unrelated. So what happens? With the mixed mating types, you still